Hi class, welcome to lesson 19 of Regents Chemistry. Today we are going to differentiate between real and ideal gases. Additionally, we are going to determine the conditions in which real gases behave most like ideal gases. Let's get started. So here is the most important information that you should record down in your notes. We will discuss each of these ideas further throughout the lesson. Today, when we talk about ideal gases, we're talking about something called the kinetic molecular theory, abbreviated the KMT. The kinetic molecular theory was made to help predict the behavior of gases using the combined gas law. If we did not believe in the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory, we cannot have the combined gas law, meaning lessons 16 and 17 would be pointless. They were not pointless, and we are going to use these assumptions throughout the year. Again, take a minute to pause the video and write down these notes so that we can discuss. You must be familiar with all four assumptions of the KMT, as these will be part of multiple choice questions on your test. The first idea is that gases are in constant random straight line motion and their pressure is equal to the force that they collide with their container. As we learned in the last lesson, if we increase temperature, particles will collide with their container more often and with greater force. Therefore, pressure will increase. We also know that decreasing the space or decreasing the volume of a container will cause the gas particles to collide with the sides of their container more often and thus increasing pressure as well. The other assumption of the kinetic molecular theory is that gas particles are so small relative to the empty space that surrounds them that gas particles have no real volume. Look at the green container. The green container shows the volume of the container or the empty space. The red particles are the atoms or molecules of gas. Compared to the green container, the red particles take up basically no space. The next assumption is that gas particles have no attractive forces. Attractive forces between molecules are called intermolecular forces, or abbreviated IMF for short. This explains why it is assumed that all gaseous mixtures are homogeneous or evenly mixed. Gas particles are known to diffuse or move from high concentration to low concentration. There's a general rule with odors. Whoever smelt it, dealt it. That's because gas particles have no attraction and will diffuse evenly throughout a room. The last assumption is that when particles collide with either their container or other particles, the gaseous particles will not gain or lose speed, but instead simply bounce off one another and maintain the total energy of the system. These types of collisions are called elastic collisions because it's kind of like just bouncing off of one another, like an elastic rubber band. This assumption is based on our understanding that the temperature of a gas particle should be related to it, the average kinetic energy. Therefore, high temperature particles will be moving very quickly while low temperature particles will be moving more slowly. Notice here how the green gas particles completely diffuse out of the unstoppered bottle. They diffuse until their concentration is evenly distributed throughout the blue particles. The green particles are moving and not attracted to one another at all. The idea of an ideal gas is great because it allows us to come up with the combined gas law. 
The combined gas law works under some conditions, but under other conditions we find that the algebra that results from the combined gas law is far from reality. That is because real gases don't do any of the assumptions that ideal gases do. Take a minute to pause the video and copy down these notes. Sometimes gases are not in constant random straight line motion. And because all gases, and all matter for that fact, is made up of atoms, their particles do take up space. Since inside atoms there's protons which are positive and electrons that are negative, gas particles do have intermolecular forces occasionally. And gas particles don't always have perfectly elastic collisions. Sometimes their systems lose energy. It is important that you know under what conditions real gases behave most ideally. That tells us what conditions the combined gas law works best to accurately predict the behavior of gases. I always remember these conditions because the most ideal conditions are similar to ours. Summertime. Because Remember in the summer, the temperatures are high and the pressure to do schoolwork is low. You can see in the image to the left that the red particle has almost no significant volume compared to the yellow space. This is under low pressure. But in the image to the right, you can see under high pressure the amount of space taken up by the red particle is considerable compared to the small space also taken up by the yellow particle. Again, remember like summer, low pressure is most ideal. You can see from this animation that under low pressure and high temperature, the particles are moving randomly with few intermolecular forces and have elastic collisions. They don't get stuck because they're moving so fast. It is important that you know that hydrogen and helium, the two smallest elements, are the most ideal gases. That is because their small size makes their volume negligible versus larger elements like the gas xenon have considerable size so we cannot ignore their masses and the combined gas law will not accurately predict their behavior. Now it is time for you to try a few practice questions. Which of the real gases most behaves like an ideal gas at STP? Look at your notes that compare the differences between ideal and real gases and find when a real gas behaves most like an ideal gas. Here's another region's question where you have to understand the main ideas of the kinetic molecular theory. This is a review question. When water vapor condenses, what happens to the potential energy? Remember, the potential energy is related to the position. Do the positions of the particles change during condensation? This concludes lesson number 19. See you in class. Make sure you bring any questions you still have. We're almost done with unit two.